Uh, the next item of business is debate on motion 17034 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on changing lives through sport and physical activity. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to speak to and move the motion for up to nine minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to bring this debate to the Chamber this afternoon. Presiding Officer, sport has the power to change lives and we know that being physically active is one of the best things we can do for our physical and mental health. Recent global research shows that levels of physical activity are declining in most developed countries with large scale changes in patterns of work and leisure leading to less active lifestyles. In contrast with this global trend, evidence shows that in Scotland we're succeeding in maintaining rates of participation. We're also seeing a number of positive signs, including a significant rise in recreational walking. In my time in post, I've seen how people of all ages and all backgrounds can change their lives and feel a sense of empowerment supported by sporting organisations across Scotland, which provide them with the tools they need to achieve their own personal goals. Changing lives is about using sport and physical activity as an intentional tool to achieve both increased participation and wider social outcomes. It can help to support well-being and resilience in communities, which is an important aim within the Active Scotland, Active Scotland Outcomes Framework. Evidence has shown that being active can bring about positive changes beyond participation. It can impact positively on the health and well-being of individuals, on their skills and learning and on communities, ensuring a more inclusive and healthier nation. Emerging from the Sport for Change report published in 2017, the Robertson Trust, Scottish Government, Sport Scotland and the former Sport for Change Network, all Changing Life partners, committed to embed a changing lives approach within Scotland's sporting system. This aim to use sport and physical activity for wider benefits such as health, education, communities and economy. Being physically active also has the potential to bring about positive and often interrelated changes. However, whilst participation in sport and physical activity can bring about positive change, it doesn't happen automatically for everyone. We need to have a clear intention to bring about change. That is most likely to happen when we have a clear focus on what change we're seeking to deliver, who we are experiencing that change, and how we'll know if it has happened. I'm keen that we get buy-in and support for the Changing Lives approach across sporting and non-sporting organisations, and we continue to build on the great work that is already happening across Scotland through partners and programmes such as Cashback and projects supported in community sports hubs. For example, last year I visited Fairfield Community Sports Hub in Dundee. With funding from Sports Scotland targeted at hubs in areas of deprivation, they launched a sports employability programme. Run in partnership with Dundee City Council Adult Learning, this programme targets unemployed men and women in the local community. It mixes desk-based learning and practical sports coaching qualifications, supporting participants back into work. The programme has also partnered up with the local prison to engage inmates in day on day release. And football and football clubs can also be a powerful force for good in communities. And a range of programmes led by the Scottish FA and partners are delivering a wide range of outcomes. Football acts as a hook to attract people to participate in a range of activities. The pioneering and hugely successful football fans in trading training programme directly funded by the Scottish Government is a notable example. Football engages people who are not attracted by traditional interventions and these are often the people who are most in need of help and who we must therefore reach. But there are countless other programmes delivering outcomes in health, education, justice and, and right across I think the whole range of portfolios. We need to work together to gain a better understanding of the needs of the wider community and individuals we are working with to help identify target groups and develop appropriate services and activities for people. I want to see the barriers, real or perceived, to participation removed. It sounds obvious, but benefits can only be achieved if people participate. We need to understand who it is who, it is who aren't participating um, in sport and physical activity and what the barriers might be that they are facing um, that stops them from participating. Yes. Alison Johnson. Thank 
you. Um, I think it's fair to say that <coughs> one barrier to getting more people, um, in particular, to cycle and to walk is the lack of safe infrastructure. Uh, the government currently spends a measly 3% of a £2.4 billion transport budget on that specific infrastructure. Does the Minister intend that we will do better in future? I mean, obviously, we're about to miss the 10% of journeys by bike by 2020 target. Thank you. Joe Fitzpatrick. I, I think we, we, we need to, to work together across um, the, the system to, to make sure that we are removing barriers. And, and I think the, the member raises a, a barrier and the member will be aware of the significant increase in funding for that area. There are some fantastic uh, projects which are in the early stages. I'm really excited about a, a project which would um, effectively move more of the streets of Dundee over to cycling. Um, clearly there's, there's, there's work to be done in order to take the majority of the population who currently don't cycle with us in that journey. Um, but clearly if we, if we want more, more of our road space to be um, safer space for cycling, we have to accept that there will be less road space, particularly in, in established streets, for, for motor cars, and, and so there's, a, there's a, a sacrifice there to be made. But I, I think if we work together, then we can take the, the whole community with us on that. Um, so I think that is one of the barriers that I think we need to, to, to work with, and we need to work um, ac across the society, so including local government and, and other partners. But barriers to participate in sport and physical activity can be complex and varied, and they can include uh, things like a lack of confidence, um, a previous negative experience of sport or physical activity um, in, in the past, person's past. Consideration, considering these barriers and how they might be stopping some of our community participating um, will help us to deliver services and activities that attract the widest range of people, including those traditionally least likely to participate. I want to see inclusive, um, accessible and stronger communities that seek to support the in, inactive to get active. The aim should be to provide everyone with the chance to get involved, no matter their age or ability. I want to see um, more family sessions, uh, which sees the, the whole family support uh, each other to take part in sport and physical activity. And person-centred approaches such as youth work and community development approaches focus on the needs, um, on the needs skills and aspirations of individuals and communities. And by building on sports development and person-centred approaches, we can create um, services and activities which uh, meet the needs of uh, the communities and our target groups. Um, our staff and volunteers across the country are, are one of our most valuable support, um, valuable resources. So engaging people from a particular community that they are working in can provide reliable, knowledgeable role models. And so we need to ensure that everyone is well supported and committed um, to what they're trying to, to change, helping develop a range of um, appropriate skills, including person-centered and sports development approaches. Um, an example would be the uh, Thrive would be Thrive, which is a toolkit for practitioners that brings together learning about what works to help in inactive people become active and it promotes, promotes a small stepped approach to supporting people on their active journeys and recognises small things can make a big difference. And that's led into the, 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 the development of the Actify uh, project, project, which I, I know members will be aware of. However, um, it, the fact is that no one organisation has the ability to make changes in their community on their own. So finding like-minded organisations and groups in local communities and, to collab and collaborating can make a, a bigger impact for everyone. So we need to make sure that we're doing that um, across the society, working with organisations and um, sporting groups. That's why the Changing Lives programme is so important in supporting organisations to use sport and physical activity to achieve positive individual and community change. Sport Scotland, the Scottish Government and the Robertson Trust and Spirit 2012 together with partners are working to deliver a wide programme of support and funding which aims to support organisations to use sport and physical activity to intentionally achieve positive individual community change as a core element of um, the existing world-class sporting system. To support community-based sport and physical activity projects across Scotland, we've benefited from a £1 million fund as part of the Changing Lives Through Sport and Physical Activity programme which was launched in April 2018, and that benefits some 17 projects nationally over the um, last while. I've got a number of examples which I wish I had time to, to cover, but um, I, I really don't. But the, the, the programme and fund are aimed at projects that demonstrate a clear commitment to the, their key aims of sport for inclusion, sport for health and wellbeing, sport for skills, and sport for communities. And I think it's, it's very much 
like to see this capacity building to ensure that changing lives approach is sustainable and becomes embedded across our system. Um, in summing up, presiding officer, I'd like to see everyone recognising the power of using sport and physical activity um, to intentionally bring about positive change for individuals and communities across Scotland. I'm looking forward to hearing about the progress of the projects that have been funded and wish everyone involved well in, in their endeavours. Um, we should have had so much more time, but, presiding officer, um, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Brian Whittle to speak to and move amendment 1703 4.2 for six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I thank the Scottish Government for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, on this topic. And I wish, uh, like the, the Minister said there, we had more time to do so. I'll start by moving uh, the amendment in my name and also uh, uh, to let everybody know that we will be supporting both the Government motion and the Labour motion. I would also say that I could quite easily make this speech in Westminster, uh, as it would be just as relevant. On Tuesday, I got to speaking to a representative of Children First who wanted to tell me how he had gotten into the park run habit and how he had been joined by his sons, uh, how his son had received the prize for the most personal best in the park run last year, how his neighbour had then joined them along with one of his son's friends who then went on to get his t-shirt for completing 10 park runs and it was the first thing he had ever won. How to beat their time they understood they would have to go out running during the week. In that one story is everything you need to know about the impact of sport and physical activity. We are talking about attainment and ambition and resilience, about confidence, inclusion, discipline, all within an active family framework. Life lessons learned far away from the classroom, yet important tools to achieve in the classroom. And along the way, a hugely positive impact on physical and mental health. If we want to tackle attainment, many of the tools a student needs are better learned outside the classroom than in it. Eye tracking, coordination and balance are crucial to attainment in the classroom. And I remember saying that in a debate on the STEP programme hosted by my colleague Liz Smith last year. And I don't know how, how many of the decision makers in this place, or any other place for that matter, fully grasped that, uh, that concept. I watched a programme on, uh, on Tuesday night, and in that programme, uh, Sebastian Coe, uh, uh, and I quote, said, sport is not funded properly. We've strangled the life out of youth services in this country. Politicians still don't really get that. They don't understand what sport is doing at community level. Now, I would go further than that. I think the issues of poor health that are preventable where sport and physical activity can play such a key role include obesity, chest, heart and stroke, COPD, type 2 diabetes, musculoskeletal and arthritis, poor mental health, uh, uh, preventable cancers and on and on. These are costing the Scottish economy around 30 billion a year and rising according to the Health and Sport Committee investigation. Physical activity is also a key element in rehabilitation. Now, that suggests to me the Scottish Government are prepared to pay for the consequences of physical inactivity rather than invest in enabling activity. Between the health and education budgets, the Scottish Government spend the best part of £18 billion, yet they allocate just over £40 million to sport. But for me, sport is such a, a good sports policy, it's a good health policy, it's a good education policy, and it's the best policy for social cohesion that I can think of. In that same programme last Tuesday, Daley Thompson said, sport is not a complete answer or the only answer, but sport can change lives for the better. Sport is the most potent social worker in any community. And what I was thinking there, there's Sebastian Cohen, Daley Thompson, was from such disparate backgrounds, close friends brought together by sport. See, sport has that capability to see past colour, creed, religion or social background and join people with a common passion and respect. In today's world, is that not something that we are striving for? And when it comes to funding, I wonder what we're we doing with the proceeds of sugar tax? How about keeping schools open during school holidays for activities? We know health inequalities are exacerbated in school holidays and food bank usage spikes. Surely this would be a good use of those extra funds. Extracurricular sport is essential if we're going to give access to opportunity. And I think this speaks very much uh, to the Labour amendment. So here we are, uh, Deputy mm -hmm. Presiding Officer, sitting in this place, and yet again, like many other forums, talking shops and conventions, having the same conversations over and over again, with so many of the same outcomes remaining unchanged. Everybody in this debate from all parties, I am sure, agrees with the potential of sport that has to have a huge positive influence both in health and in education. 
Yet I have to say it's doubtful if many of the politicians or civil servants have the background or knowledge to fully appreciate the power of sport. I would love to bring somebody like a Kelly Holmes in here so there is an opportunity to hear from someone who's lived it, where sport has shaped who she is and, 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 and through her organisation is now helping thousands of disenfranchised children find their way back into society using sport as a medium. Sport has that potential to offer children an alternative path in life, not necessarily into a life of sport, but using sport as an enabler to re-engage. We have to make sport accessible to all, make it easy to participate. Now, a few uh, suggestions to finish, if I may, uh, Deputy Presenting Officer. I would like to see a PE specialist in every primary school. It's so obvious. We want to fully utilise the school estate, especially at the end of the school day, before pupils go home and recognise the importance of extracurricular activity. Don't wait for pupils to come to sport. Bring the sport to them. Use schools as a community hub outside of school time, including in school holidays, where activity and a healthy meal continue to be part of all pupils' day. Connect up PE lessons with what's on offer in the community. Make sure what is learned in PE can be applied on an ongoing basis. Or if there is a desire for a certain activity, bring the national government body in to help deliver on that passion. We need to look to the third sector, the clubs, the organisations who deliver against this agenda and look at how we recruit into the third sector. Dr Frank Dick wrote uh, a really interesting paper on this and it's definitely worth a read. And finally, make sure there's a pathway for young sportsmen and women to travel and a destination on that path that matches their ambition. Presiding officer, I would so much I would like to say on this topic, as you know, if I had a bit more time. I think the government motion suggests their intent and I genuinely believe uh, that that's the direction of travel they want to go in. However, the current system is a very long way from delivering what it can in this agenda and there is much more to be done if we are to truly recognise the importance of sport and realise its potential for the people of Scotland. I now call David Stewart to speak to and move Amendment 17034.1 for five minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Sport and physical activity, of course, is the ideal social prescribing tool, the key preventative spend for the health service, but also it's crucial for the economic productivity of our nation. Let me give you uh, one example. Scientists at the University of Alberta observed two and a half thousand families. They found that two hours or more a day on devices such as smartphones were linked to high rates of behaviour problems in younger children. However, this was offset by participation in organised sport. The leader of the study, uh, Dr Mandheim, said it wasn't physical activity on its own that was proactive. Uh, the activity needed of a structure. The more time children spent doing organised sports, the less likely they were to exhibit behavioural problems. So the key conclusion in this study was that playing organised sport appeared to have the strongest association with improved behaviour. Now, the premise of the Scottish Government motion is correct. And yes, President Officer, you won't hear me say that very often. Uh, lives can be changed through sport and physical activity. It's a key part of a healthy lifestyle. Being active, as we've heard, improves the, the health of the heart, muscles, bones and immune system. Lesser known, but equally importantly, physical activity can boost mental well-being and improves mood and sleep quality. Now, that does not mean, President Officer, that we all need to be award-winning athletes like uh, Brian Whittle. Uh, who I suspect is faster on one running shoe than I am on two. Uh, but the key is that activity must be normalised. By that I mean regular and measurable. 10,000 steps, a daily mile, taking the stairs, not the lift. And during my time, President Officer, on the corporate body, we were discussing member room allocation. And one wit, who will remain nameless, uh, suggested that the rooms on the highest floor, furthest from the lift, should be allocated to members most in need of physical activity. Now, my football club in Renes Cali Thistle, and I refer to my register of interests, uh, offer exercise classes to fans over 50, and that includes walking football, which is very successful. And last year, I watched a game during the presiding officer's tour at Charleston Academy in Renes. One of the star players had early onset dementia. However, I am concerned that poor levels of participation in sport are exacerbated by deprivation. Figures from the 2017 Scottish Health Survey revealed that, and I quote, adult physical activity rates were significantly associated with areas of deprivation. So, physical activity was highest in the least deprived areas 
and was lowest in the most deprived areas. Now, we all know from personal experience, I'm sure, uh, that taking part in sport comes with a price tag, clothing, equipment, club membership, class fees. Low uh, income households are far too often priced out of sports clubs, gyms and activities, even if they exist in the local community. But also, lower physical activity levels were also associated with age and sex. So, for example, two thirds of adults, only two thirds of adults met the guidelines for physical activity, but lower levels of activity were associated with increased age, as you would expect, and being female. The other main strand of my amendment, presiding officer, in my name is about recovery and rehabilitation. We've heard that already from Brian Whittle. Physical activity is, of course, crucial for recovery from illness and injury, but also it's a key factor in maintaining the well-being of people uh, living with long-term conditions. And again, the 2017 Scottish Household Survey showed that individuals living with long-term conditions are far, far less likely, as you'd expect, to be physically active, just 40%, compared to 89% of people with no conditions. So there are clear gaps in the provision of appropriate physical activity programmes and rehab support across Scotland's communities. But don't just take my word for it. Arthritis Research UK have called on the Scottish Government to support local healthcare providers to boost programmes for people with musculoskeletal conditions. And the Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland estimate that there are 70,000 people in Scotland could benefit by pulmonary rehab, yet currently there's only capacity for 6,000. And I mentioned to the Minister, through you, President Officer, in my own health board in Highland, uh, it's been estimated there's 3,400 patients with COPD who'd benefit from this rehab. The current capacity is 307, a shocking 9% of the totals. So school activities are vital for closing the participation gap. Now, Scottish Labour, as you will know, Prime Officer established the Active Schools Network in 2004, and we want to see an increase in level three of affordable sport. Brian Whittle mentioned the point about the soft drinks industrial levy, and in the wind-up, perhaps the Minister can refer to this, the UK Government promised a billion uh, worth of funding for school sports between 17 and 2010. Can the Minister for confirm if he's paying attention. Can the Minister confirm in his closing remarks that the Scottish Government <laughs> will commit to ring fence the Barnet Consequentials to fund free sports uh, in schools? And in closing, President Officer, uh, this has been an important debate uh, and which I welcome. I move the amendment in my name. And in conclusion, as John F. Kennedy said, physical fitness is not only one of the most important keys to a healthy body, it's the basis of dynamic, creative, intellectual activity. Call Alison Johnson. Four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to draw members' attention to my register of interests. I really welcome this debate on the positive effects of sport and physical activity on Scotland's population, and I'd like to thank the many organisations who've provided briefings. Um, I'll say at the outset that I will, the Scottish Greens will support both the Government motion and the Labour and Conservative amendments. I think we all understand that the health, the social and the economic benefits of physical activity are well publicised and there's compelling scientific evidence that regular physical activity is beneficial for both body and mind. And I, I'm pleased that both the Conservative and the Labour amendments today address the issue of access on which I'd also like to focus. I welcome the Scottish Government's motion which recognises the many benefits that sport can bring to communities. Um, I'm sure we all recognise that there is great variation still in the ability to take part in sport and physical activity across the country. There is an explicit link, I think David Stewart has focused on this, between deprivation and physical inactivity. And while I agree that it would be wonderful and it has to be our aim that everyone in Scotland can ride their bike to school or work, that they can join a local football team if that's their thing, or that they can simply go for a walk in the local park on a regular basis, it's still an oversimplification to say that this is always a matter of choice sports facilities can be prohibitively expensive for families and that's if they're available at all. Um, in my own region, Meadowbank is currently closed for long overdue refurbishment but in order for that work to be funded, part of the site has had to be sold off. Now that's an unsustainable model. You know, we can't fund future refurbishments by selling off land for housing. You know, as much as that housing is needed, this is not, we have to sustain and maintain these facilities. We need to invest in leisure and sports facilities in Scotland. Otherwise, people will find it much more difficult to lead the healthy, active lifestyle that we want them to. And we also need to ensure that infrastructure is in place to allow walking and cycling. 
A recent study into inequalities in active travel found that people living in the most deprived areas were more likely to undertake journeys on foot or by bike than those in the least deprived. And walking does really well, as, as the Minister will appreciate, in terms of gender equality. 69% of men and 71% of women taking part in recreational walking. That bucks the usual trend. Greater investment in walking and cycling will really benefit those living in areas of deprivation and will help to reduce health inequalities. The Greens have a long-standing policy, as, as long as I can remember being a member of the party, that active travel should get at least 10% of the transport budget. That is backed by the Institute of Public Health Directors and many more. So that spending would, that would bring spending up to £25 a head. That would put us on a par with spending levels in the Netherlands. And if anyone's interested in having a look, I think um, it's fair to say that they are not suffering from the obesity epidemic that we're seeing here. We need to build, as Brian Whittle said, activity into daily life. We don't always have the time to do something specific, but if you can get some exercise getting to and from work, that's really important. Um, on the issue of access to local quality green space, we know that that improves your physical and mental health. Parks and green spaces are estimated to save the NHS £111 million a year. That's based solely on a reduction in visits to the GP. Green Space Scotland tell us that 90% of urban Scots say that this green space is important to them. But one in four Scots say the quality of that green space has declined in the last five years. Public parks and sports areas account for just 4% and 9% of green space respectively. Now, austerity does continue to impact on public sector spending. Council expenditure on parks and green spaces has continued to decline. So we have to make sure that we, we see leadership from this parliament. We have to ensure that people have got access to facilities and spaces where they can run, walk and play. Um, in closing, presiding officer, I think it's the government previously produced a report or one of its agencies did on the amount of green space that had been lost, on the amount of playing fields that had been lost in any year. And I'd be grateful if the minister could have a look into whether or not that information is available because I'm finding it hard to get hold of. And in really closing, presiding officer, um, I'll just say thank you to the chamber there. Thank you. Tavish Scott, uh, that'll be another four minute contribution, please. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, sport inspires, and uh, tomorrow night my nine-year-old son uh, has the great dilemma of whether to wear his Sadio Mane shirt or his Mo Salah shirt uh, when I take him down to Anfield with his older brother to watch the title run-in. Uh, Brian Whittle's wife, I'm going to take up Brian Whittle's uh, challenge. Uh, we have these debates from time to time and we talk uh, around these issues and I, I think I've heard Brian Whittle make uh, the kind of positive contribution he made. I've certainly heard sports minister after sports minister um, make the kind of contribution that Joe Fitzpatrick rightly did today and talk about many things that we all agree with. But it's making things happen uh, in this area that really uh, matters. So on that, uh, on that, on that principle, um, I got uh, together some people uh, to uh, try to build uh, what Paul uh, Laurie and uh, Stephen Gallagher's golf foundations are doing, uh, one in the northeast uh, where obviously uh, Paul Laurie uh, is resident and uh, Stephen Gallagher in West Lothian. Uh, what we're hoping to do, and we, we had a very useful meeting with the Deputy First Minister, uh, what we're hoping to do is, is take that uh, programme around uh, Scotland, make sure it's available to all. Uh, and we met the Deputy First Minister because the very point the, the the sports minister made in his speech. It's not just about sport, actually sport's neither here nor there. It's actually about participation, it's about uh, people from every background. It's, for example, involving uh, children with disabilities as well. They can try golf uh, too. This is a programme that's uh, all about uh, the broadest possible advantages that sport can bring, that uh, contributions uh, that in this debate so far have already rightly uh, mentioned. And that it's the kind of initiative that I hope uh, will be particularly important for the future of golf, which, uh, as we are the home of golf in Scotland, uh, we need to constantly um, stress and constantly work on but it's uh, so much more than that because of the advantages it brings to young people's self-esteem for their ability uh, to take up a, a new uh, game that they haven't tried before and if they like it stay with it uh, and then to move that uh, experience um, uh, and take that experience through uh, life it is after all one of the sports that I was going to say easy to play all life uh, I know Brian Whittle's golf game um, uh, um, it's possible to play, uh, uh, might be a better way uh, of, of putting it. Uh, the other point I wanted to make, uh, firstly, was on Alan jo Alison Johnson's point about, um, about uh, infrastructure or uh, 
uh, facilities. Um, in Shetton, we built a 60-40 indoor 4G um, facility some years back, uh, linked to the New Anson High School in Lerwick, uh, and it provides um, state-of-the-art uh, facilities. The best bit about it is mums and dads can take their wee ones to, for example, football training or rugby training, and it's inside. It's not heated or anything, doesn't need to be, but in Shetland's climate, I may say, it's not always as you see it on the telly when you're watching Shetland drama programmes. It does occasionally rain, and it occasionally blows a blinking hoolie as well. Um, so the advantage to junior coaching, particularly from those facilities, uh, that facility rather, is absolutely phenomenal and is already paying off. And I take Alison Johnson's point, and I suspect uh, others as well, that that kind of facility needs to be um, much more widely available right around uh, Scotland, certainly in, in the uh, far-flung parts of, uh, of, uh, of, of the country. A uh, couple of points just to finish with, if I may, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this weekend, uh, or, or sorry, uh, shortly, the um, Shetland um, women's uh, netball team will play in the final of the Evelyn Beatty Quake. Uh, last weekend, they beat the Glasgow South Salta. Sorry, Joanne Lamont, uh, maybe uh, in your patch, but um, uh, they're into the final of that. Great achievement for uh, the Shetland um, women's netball team. The Shetland women's hockey team uh, play Orkney. Glad Liam MacArthur isn't here. They play Orkney this weekend in the semi-final of the Scottish District Cup, and I hope we win. Uh, and... Um, uh, just since I'm on um, women in, and participation in sport, uh, the Shetland women's rugby team has had a phenomenally successful year, and that sport is growing and developing uh, in my part of the world, as it is indeed in fairness across the country. Sport can inspire. On that, I absolutely agree with Brian Little. Uh, we move on to the, the open contributions. Can I say that the opening speakers have used up most of the extra time, so strict four-minute speeches, please. Sandra White, followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, some very, very interesting speeches, and I think I agree with everything that was said. Uh, I'm not going to speak about the various clubs, etc., in my constituency, which I normally do, but I came across a very, very interesting project, and it's actually a programme which has been launched by the Scottish Government. So it's a significant programme. So I thought I would bring it to you and put my, my hat on as a convener of the Older People Age and Ageing Cross Party Group. And my focus will be on this uh, significant programme, which has been carried out by the Care Inspectorate. Uh, 2016, the Care Inspectorate was commissioned by the Scottish Government to deliver care about physical activity. We call it CAPA for short. It's an improvement programme aimed to improve the health and well-being and independence and quality of life uh, of older people which are experiencing care across Scotland in home and also in care homes. And it's uh, been hailed a complete success uh, with the independent research uh, results from that. And it empowers care staff with confidence, knowledge and skills to promote and enable opportunities for movement for older people experiencing care. It was delivered across the areas in Scotland involved up to 140 care services, including care homes, re-enabling services, daycare, sheltered housing and care at home services. And the independent research, which I have already mentioned, commissioned by the Care Inspectorate, found that older people involved in the programme basically improved their hand grip strength, their leg strength, increased their flexibility, which improved mobility and levels of independence and significantly reduce their likelihood of falls as a result of moving more and moving about more. The research also found the programme supported people to feel happier, satisfied, more satisfied with their lives, more worthwhile, and felt less anxious after being involved in the CAPA programme. And uh, the experience in people experiencing care reported improvements in their quality of life, including they felt a sense of purpose, more socially connected, which is part of the, the motion in the government's motion, a greater sense of well-being, more confident, and a result, as I say, of moving about each day. But there's one particular strand of the CAPA programme which I found really, really interesting. I wanted to highlight it to you. It's an intergenerational project. It's a winning project. I actually won an award of the most inspiring innovative project at the 2018 Sc Scottish Government and Healthcare Improvement uh, Scotland Quality Awards in that respect. And really, it's about bringing nursery school kids along. You've seen it on the TV, but this is actually throughout Scotland. It's not just uh, on the television. It's actually happening here. And basically, they bring local residents and kids from nursery schools together. And together, that means that people are more active. In fact, a pilot project was set up with a group of residents, parents, staff from care homes, 
and nurseries together. So it really discussed what they wanted to get out of the project and ideas about what changes they could make to sessions to benefit both generations. Uh, so basically you'll say, well, what were the benefits? Well, the office would benefit in terms of social interaction between the older and younger participants. However, the children, apart from just doing their one mile to the care home, that's great for them, but they actually started to walk more and walk quicker as well uh, and improve their healthiness and their fitness. And that was the nursery school uh, kids. The residents' activity levels were also measured each session and it showed that there was much more physical ability, much more well-being, as I said before, anxiety, happiness and confidence all went hand in hand with these two projects together. Now, it's present across Scotland, as I said, and also across Glasgow as well, on a weekly basis, but it's quite sporadic. Some in my area and some in, not in other areas as well. And the project model really does benefit everybody who's involved in it. So in closing, presiding officer, I I'd certainly advocate the intergenerational work, but I would like to see it more across more of Scotland. And I just wonder if the minister needs summing up or whatever it may be, if there are any more plans to push this project further out in the country. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Miles Briggs, followed by George Adam. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to take part in today's debate on changing lives through sport and physical activity. Sport and physical activity can undoubtedly go a long way in improving the health and well-being of individuals, as well as having wider benefits to society. And the challenge, as Brian Whittle outlined, is encouraging more people to participate in sport and physical activity. And nowhere is this bigger, a bigger challenge than in deprived communities. Sport and physical activity can provide significant benefits for everyone, but it's our young people who can benefit the most from sport and physical exercise with health benefits in later life. Now, I'd like to start by welcoming some of the good work the Scottish Government has taken forward, including the work around community sports hubs, which those of us who sit in the sport, Health and Sport Committee have had the chance to visit, myself uh, visiting the one in Abbey Moor, and was hugely impressed by that work. I'd like to recognise the work of my fellow St Johnston's fan, uh, Aileen Campbell, when she was Sports Minister and working to take this work forward. Alison Johnston and Tavish Scott have both highlighted, I think, important par par points to this debate. And that's what, that we actually need to make things happen. I'm therefore very concerned about the cuts to sport and leisure budgets which we're seeing across councils across our country. In Edinburgh, for example, the Edinburgh City Council um, has seen an 8.6% cut which the councils decided to make to the sport and leisure budgets, one of the largest cuts of any budget um, in, in the council. The City Council has, strong, uh, has a strong opposition to reducing um, funding, which has themselves looked towards aiming to um, take forward the Healthier Lifestyle Programme, which the capital has said is part of its priorities. Now, these cuts mean that the cost of accessing services um, will go up and increase and go against the actual strategy the Council's put forward. Last summer, the City of Edinburgh Council proposed sport club clubs in the city would pay £35 an hour to use school sports halls, a proposal which I raised during the last sports debate with the Cabinet Secretary, which was going to directly hit junior sports clubs across the capital. Now, I'm pleased that the proposals were put on hold following public outcry, but since then, Edinburgh City Council has stated that they're now planning to still raise fees for clubs using sports facilities, putting up barriers to local sports clubs at the very time when we should be trying to take these down. And I think that's at the heart of what Tavish Scott was really raising. We can have this debate and we can talk about progress, but actually councils are where often that progress is being unpicked or actually where barriers are putting up to, to some of the potential solutions we all want to see. I've really not got time, I've only got four minutes. Now, there are many charities across Lothian doing exceptional work in trying to change people's lives through sport. One of the charities which I've been working with is the School of Hard Knocks that uses sport to build people's confidence and develop skills for getting into employment. I recently attended their awards event hosted at Spartans Community Football Club here in the capital. In the last year, the charity's worked with over 100 adults with 40% finding employment, 8% now volunteering, and 18% moving into further education or training. Of the adults completing the School of Hard Knocks, 95% have improved self-confidence, motivation, hopefulness, and ability to face ch the challenges of getting back into the workplace. After talking with participants in the programme from the School of Hard Knocks, at this event, it was clear and from their first-hand experience that graduates felt that the transformational effect that sport had offered uh, to their lives. 
Improving the health and well-being of everyone in Scotland is something that every member of this chamber is united in and believing we can all help to achieve. There's a lot of positive stories and benefits that sport and physical activity can bring. However, we need to focus our efforts on improving participation rates across Scotland and how that's delivered in our councils. I'm, I'm very much engaged with this and I know across the chamber we all want to see this happen, but I want to make sure that the barriers which sometimes councils are being put up, the government are wise to. And I, move, I support the amendment in my colleague Brian Whittle's name. Thank you. George Adam, followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, presiding officer. I know we always uh, welcome a debate in the chamber. It becomes a bit of a cliche at the start of all of our speeches. But for me, I wholeheartedly uh, believe in what we're trying to achieve here with this debate. Because it's not just about the medals you win or the trophies or how high you can jump or how far you can jump. It's not about how fast you can run or how hard you can kick or hit any size or shape of ball. This is about changing people's lives for the better and using sport as a key element of that. The timing of this date could not be better for me as it comes in the middle of MS Awareness Week. Now, I'm not one for taking advantage of an opportunity, presiding officer, but I would like to talk to you about a project that has uh, had joint funding by the MS Society Scotland and the Scottish Government. The Active Together Scotland project was a multi-layered programme that, uh, that aimed to support those with MS and affected by MS to continue to stay active. This obviously needs to be extremely focused as one of the few symptoms that those with MS have is chronic fatigue. The project was co-designed and developed by people uh, with MS and ran between August 2017 and November 2018. And the findings from this project were interesting. The MS Society found that uh, as people's confidence and attitudes or to physical activity and exercise grew, there was a movement to which approach they interacted with and found most useful within the programmes on offer. And this is obviously empowering those with MS involved in the programme as well. And there was a number of, uh, they, they also found that people with MS, which is, this is really quite interesting, people with MS want to take part in activities that are MS friendly and suitable for their condition, but at the same time, they felt less comfortable being in an MS only environment, which has uh, isolated them from people of other abilities and conditions. And people with MS, presiding officer, basically want to be seen as an equal part of our community. And sport and activity and fitness is a way for them to do that as well. And some of the quotes that came from some of the people, the 200 plus people that participated in the programme was, it was a very emotional getting on a horse again. And my daughters were so proud that I did it. That was from a woman that was a horse riding participant in the programme. I have, I have found my forever sport, as regardless of what happens to me through my MS, I can continue to curl, obviously, someone that was involved in that sport that everybody knows uh, actually was its origins are in Paisley. You know, so it's one of these things when you look at how this programme, the Scottish Government and the MS Society working together, how they could actually make a difference in these people's lives. They are now moving on to continue their activities as well. But I also have a vision for uh, sport and activity in the community. And St Murn FC, I may have mentioned this before, but I'm a supporter of St Murn FC. We went so far to try and push this programme forward that we could actually, uh, we bought the club uh, as a community. And my vision is similar to what Miles Briggs said about Spartans, was our vision is to build a football club that's fantastic in the community programme and make it better. St Murnard and Fergusley Park, right in the heart of Paisley. Effectively, always mentioned in this place when you talk about deprivation. So my idea would be, and we'll work to this programme through, is how can we make a sports development, multi-sports development, to help people with education? to help people with uh, access to work, to make sure that they get these opportunities to actually use sport as a way to gain confidence to move forward in the world. And that, for me, is the most important thing, presiding officer, because as we go through this debate and we talk about, you know, if someone wins a medal and they come from Paisley or Riven, I'll take that for any young person, but it's not all about that. Sport isn't all about winning. It's about changing people's lives and making sure we can send them and be all they can be in the future. Johan Lamont, followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. 
Um, I usually start off by saying I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate, and I don't want to come across as a curmudgeon, but I have to say I've enjoyed the debate far more than I expected to, and I thought that there have been very substantial and interesting um, contributions thus far. But I do want to just say that I think that the, the Scottish Government needs to think about how it's allocating its time. I think there is an issue about thinking about safe debates, which are, in fact, as we've shown, not that safe at all. But I think we need to be careful that we're not simply rehearsing these arguments over and over. And I would make a plea to the Minister to think with his government about how government time is being used so it can really uh, challenge and make a difference. I'm not casting any aspersions on the commitment of the Minister to this issue. I have no objection or disagreement on the self-evident truth of the, of the substance of the motion or of those who have made a very serious contribution in their speeches. And for the absence of the doubt, I absolutely agree that physical activity is good for people's health and for our communities. Indeed, as a young woman who was not particularly involved in sport, the development in the 80s of running for fun and the, the, the fun run movement actually got me out with a pair of trainers running to the point where I, at one point, managed not quite to run, but at least to finish a marathon. So I know that that kind of unusual sport, not just formal sport, is really, really important in people's lives. And also, of course, in a city where a Labour Council actively decided that in order to address the economic challenges and the health challenges of that city, they were going to do massive things around culture and around sport, to the extent that we hosted the Commonwealth Games and we are now one of the most popular venues in the world for sport. It's testimony to what sport can do. And despite some evidence to the contrary, I am all in favour of building consensus. But I think the real challenge in building consensus is not just on what, not even just on why, but also on how. And I think too often these issues of how we then take our aspiration forward are left behind. We have debates where we settle for the lines to take and the party divisions rather than then connecting that to real changes um, in our policy thinking. I've made this plea on innumerable times round education. Joe Fitzpatrick. For taking the intervention. The member says, asks about the how, and one of the hows is the Changing Lives Fund that I managed to talk a little bit about. And, and one of the, 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 the organisations that have been funded from that that I didn't manage to, to mention earlier was Active Stilling and Signpost Recovery, who I visited last week. And, and there it was really inspiring to hear directly from service users about their lived experience of substance use and the vital part that sport and physical activity is playing as part of their recovery. And that's just one of the examples of the how we're managing to use sport and physical activity to really change lives. And we're, we're doing it now. And so thank you. Uh, I'll give you two, four and a half minutes. Joanne oh, Lamont. Thank you very much. I always overindulge myself anyway, and I appreciate that from you, um, Deputy First Minister. I just, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I wanted to make the point about, we have asked for an education debate on substantial issues. And I think in general terms, the government should look at that, that uh, point. But on the issue raised by the Minister, he is right, there are lots of good things happening. There are lots of brilliant ideas in here. I don't think they're being transmorative enough because we're not challenging some of the fundamental decisions the government are making that are shaping our capacity to do these. So it's not just aspiration, it's not just policy, it's the budget decisions this government is making which are having direct consequences on the capacity for local authorities and local communities to deliver our change, um, our, our, our aspire changes. I would make fundamentally this point, local government cuts are having consequences in terms of our capacity to deliver at a local level. We know that community football, for example, does far more than just teach young people about football, but they do that without one coin of support from anybody in the system, and I think we need to look at that. I was a swim mum and spent too many mornings in my life going to uh, a swimming pool at five in the morning. It would have been impossible if my husband was not able to share that and we didn't have a car. So we know that inequality is burnt in to some of the issues around sport. And I think, again, we need to hear from the government how they connect their aspiration, which is absolutely right, to the budget choices that are actually making those aspirations far more difficult. Right, close, um, please. And on that, I just would ask the minister, in his summing up, to, talk, to address that question about whether the budget choices match up with the policy aspiration that we can all sign up for. Jenny Gilruth, followed by Peter Chapman. 
Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Sports and physical activity have the power to change lives. We know that if you eat well and exercise, you're more likely to live longer, you're less likely to get ill, you're more likely to be happy. Sport has a propensity to do that, and even mild physical activity like walking has a power to make everyone, including cynical MSPs, feel better about themselves. Too often, however, access to sport is predicated on the ability to pay. Gym membership, swimming lessons, or even buying a bike, for example. In the dim and now seemingly distant past, I used to teach about health inequalities in modern studies. This was around the time of the infamous sick man of, uh, fat man of Europe rather headline. And I recall in a classroom not too far away from where we are now, being confidently told by a senior class one day that if poor people couldn't afford gym membership, then they could simply go for a run. We then got into a really good debate about why that might not be possible, about environments and about their impact on life expectancy, for example. And later that year, I arranged for the then Chief Medical Officer, uh, Sir Harry Burns, to come and speak to the class about health inequalities. And I will always remember his presentation about the importance of relationships in formative years, access to green space and, of course, regular exercise, things many of my pupils growing up in leafy Barnton often took for granted. In the Kingdom of Fife, our Sports and Leisure Trust is required by Fife Council to widen the level of participation in sports and active recreation, to develop opportunities and pathways for people to take up and to fill their potential in sports, and to provide good quality, adequately resourced facilities and services which meet the needs and aspirations of Fifers and visitors to the area. And since its launch in 2008, the Trust has seen a two-thirds increase in male membership in gyms and a 90% increase in children aged 5 to 17 and an 84% increase in adults aged 18 to 64. And Fife Sports and Leisure Trust is actually helping to contribute to an estimated £2.7 million in savings to health services in Fife as a result. Indeed, the Scottish Health Survey published in 2016 showed that 63% of adults and 73% of children in Scotland met the guidelines for moderate or vigorous physical activity in the previous year. Scottish Government research shows that a lack of physical activity contributes to nearly 2,500 deaths in Scotland and costs the NHS around £91 million a year. Preventative spend and investment in sport and activity for all is therefore vital. Last week, I visited Rainbow Nursery in Glenrothes as part of their Easter Welly Walk. It was a real pr privilege to walk with the toddlers along Bobbling Glen Way and to roll eggs at Warwick Stadium. Although uh, small, these children were certainly determined with their egg rolling and I was very careful to dart out of the road to avoid being torpedoed by a stray boiled egg. Rainbow Nursery are a great example of an ELC setting which embeds outdoor learning in all that they do. Walking was just another part of Wednesday's learning. And we know that if children are taught about the importance of sport and exercise at a young age, they are much more likely to contribute and to take part throughout their adult lives. In 2017, the Parliament's Health and Sport Committee, of which I'm a former member, published results of our inquiry into sport for all. And I always remember being taken by the evidence we heard from the Robertson Trust about access to the school estate. And they told us about the cost of accessing the school estate, which are often too high. We've had conversations with organisations seeking to take on or to build their own facility due to the fact they are not able to access facilities in their local community at a time or a price that is suitable for them. Now, I appreciate that's out with the, the Minister's portfolio today, but I would be grateful if he could perhaps consider reflecting upon the use of the school estate uh, within the parameters of closing the poverty-related attainment gap and the obvious opportunities which should present from opening up our schools for community use. Presiding officer, uh, this afternoon's motion is focused on sports and physical activity to change lives and to promote social cohesion. Our schools are well placed to advance this agenda and many already do so. Early years uh, learning settings embed outdoor learning uh, using physical activity every day, but we should all resolve to think more critically about the ways in which we can make sport more accessible to our constituents in an area which often excludes the poorest from society. Thank you. Peter Chapman, followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Just before the Easter recess, I took part in a debate led by my colleague Brian Whittle about the importance of a healthy diet to tackle Scotland's growing problems with obesity. In our debate, we discussed how important it is to teach our kids the value of good, nutrient-rich food. It is, it is clear that, in addition, we must also teach our kids the necessity to live an active lifestyle. A healthy diet and an active lifestyle go hand in hand. Only two-thirds of Scottish adults meet guidelines for physical activity in 2017. Two-thirds of adults in Scotland are overweight, including 29% who are obese, leaving Scotland with the worst obesity records among the OECD countries. 
Cancer research statistics show that the obesity crisis in Scotland has led to an estimated 4,800 cases of bowel cancer in the last decade. Now, this is a national crisis. There is no easy fix, but if we can help to ensure measures are put in place to reduce health inequality by giving more opportunities for our schools to provide the best physical activity and provide healthy meals, that would be a good start for our children. Last year, the Scottish Conservatives set out our strategy to improve both nutrition, nutrition ac activity and to reduce health inequalities in Scotland. This strategy focused on the link between nutrition, activity and education. Only 33% of children aged 5 to 15 were active at the recommended level of at least 60 minutes on every day of the week. And these figures declined massively as children got older from 45% of children aged 5 to 7 to only 18% of those aged 13 to 15. Something is going seriously wrong here. School is a place where many children get their first experience of sport and we must use that opportunity and take sport and physical activity to the children in our schools rather than hope for them to seek it outside of school. I will. Joe Fitzpatrick. I thank the member for taking intervention because he does let me make a point about the Active Schools programme, which is a, a programme which I think has had support across the chamber. It's been in place for a number of years and, and it's a programme which I think is to be commended. It, over 309,000 young people engaged in 2018 and it bucks the trend in terms of um, um, economic deprivation and, and the access to, and participation within that scheme goes right across uh, Scotland and across communities. Peter Chapman. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that intervention and I agree entirely with him. But the point is, I believe that many more hubs for out-of-school activities should be established to ensure that social inclusion is available for all, coupled with the opportunity to participate in an activity of choice. So we need to do more. And if schools open their facilities to more out of our clubs, there will be more opportunities for local teams and clubs to grow and more youngsters would get a chance to enjoy sport. The long-term strategic nature of these recommendations would not only have a positive effect on reducing physical health inequalities and improving sport participation, but it would also help in the prevention of mental health issues. Mental health organisation SAMH states, the three main principles for good mental health are inclusivity, namely opportunities to participate in social activity, consistent mental activity and consistent physical activity. And James Jopling, Samaritan's Executive Director for Scotland, says physical activity can provide mental health and well-being benefits of itself, but can also provide an environment for individuals to connect with other people and provide an antidote for some of the feelings of social isolation and loneliness. Attainment studies show that pupils who have an, pupils who have an active lifestyle outside of school show significant improvements in attention, behaviour and academic achievement. So as, in clo as, as closing the attainment gap is a priority for every political party and given consistent evidence that shows having an active lifestyle can be a solution, it is vital that a sport and active lifestyle strategy, strategy should be front and centre of any plan to tackle the attainment gap and health inequality. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, I want to talk about cycling, which will come as no surprise to people who know me. The health benefits of cycling are clear, and it's a form of exercise that can be for recreational use as, as well as endurance, but also as a way to go about your, da your daily life. Um, and it's also a, an everyday way of protecting the environment, and bikes were zero emissions before that phrase was ever invented. And cycling can help to reduce the risk of chronic illnesses such as heart disease, type 2 diabetes and stroke, while also boosting your mood and keep your weight under control. It's, it's low impact and it's very good for your core muscles uh, and when you can do it safely, it's also great fun. But I'd also like to associate myself with comments that Alison Johnson has made around cycling safety and the need for better, safer infrastructure. And GPs around Scotland are beginning to prescribe activities such as walking and cycling to help treat illnesses, including diabetes, heart, uh, heart disease. And it's long been the case that uh, exercise has been prescribed to patients suffering from depression. And I can recommend cycling as an ideal activity in that regard. And cycling hubs um, 
given people access to bikes are springing up throughout the country, people who can't afford to buy a bike, um, there's cycling hubs all over the country. I believe that everyone should have the right to a bike and uh, cost can be a barrier to, uh, to the sustainable and cheap to run form of transport as well as a great source of exercise. But I, I also think that, that not only just have a right to a bike, we should have a right to cycle that bike without fear of uh, getting killed. And uh, road deaths, although road deaths are down in Scotland uh, from 2018 figures, uh, deaths of road cyclists are up by 16%, which I, I think is, uh, should is a, a sobering statistic. However, in the northeast of Scotland, the, you know, with some, some positive things, the University of uh, Aberdeen has benefited from investment in electric bikes. The e-bike grant fund from the Scottish Government awarded the institution 15,000 for 12 e-bikes past year. The grants focused on providing support to community organisations, local authorities, public sector agencies, colleges and universities through direct grants. And it helps to ensure that people across Scotland can access the benefits of, of this new exciting way of cycling. Um, and it's one of the great uh, examples of the investment in cycle, cycling and active travel that the uh, Scottish Government are doing. But uh, as Dave Stewart said in his, his contribution, that uh, there's also a, a, an economic benefit as well of the preventative spend in uh, investment into things like cycling. In my Aberdeenshire East constituency, there are very many brilliant routes to get out and about, walk and cycle for leisure, uh, like the Fermart and Buckham Way. But, However, cycling infrastructure for those wishing to commute between towns in Aberdeenshire or into Aberdeen City itself, I believe is not fit for purpose, and I say that from personal experience. And I think real investment needs to be made to encourage people into swapping cars for bikes for their daily commute or for doing their shopping or just simply you know, uh, going about their daily lives. All the same, recreational cycling can also be a, a good way to socialise, meet new people, something um, and I think it's also been mentioned, uh, can combat social isolation and uh, loneliness. And there are a number of groups in my constituency. We've got the Buck and Durdler Cycling Club, based in Mintlaw. Uh, the Bells on Bikes Network of Women's Cycling Groups is a, a Scotland-wide organisation. They've also got a group in Aberdeenshire. Uh, it's uh, about a friendly, inclusive and relaxed environment for women to take up cycling. Um, in January, I celebrated a milestone birthday and received a brand new Dutch road bike from my family. Uh, yesterday, Jenny Eagle Ruth suggested that I just talk for, t for four minutes. I think she was making a criticism of the fact I'm always banging on about it. But I do want to use my passion for cycling to be a vehicle to urge the government once again to look at real transformational infrastructure investment in cycling, to put Scotland on a par with our European neighbours like Denmark and the Netherlands. Cycling should not be something people just talk about as a hobby, like I've just done. With good comprehensive cycling infrastructure, the citizens of Scotland should be a, could be a cycling nation, cycling every day with all the health and environmental benefits that brings. Well Move to the closing speeches. David Stewart, four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This has been a, an excellent debate, and in my 12 years in this place, it's the first time I can safely say that I've agreed with every word of every speaker in the debate. Perhaps, uh, President Officer, I'm getting a bit mellow in my, in my old age. Um, first of all, Brian Whittle uh, spoke, I think, extremely well with his background in sport, that sport gives life lessons far from the classroom. Talked about how sport is not funded adequately, but has a very uh, preventative role. But, of course, I agreed with the point he said, which is that good sport policy is good education policy. Uh, and the quote that he gave about um, that good sport is the most potent social worker in any community is a very relevant one. I support him in that. Uh, I also agreed with Alison uh, Johnston about sport is good for body and mind, but access is key. And she gave a very good local example of Meadowbank. And I didn't realize the issue about the land uh, and refurb. refurb. That's a very good example um, of uh, the importance of access. But the infrastructure for walking and cycling is crucial. And the green policy, if I remember it correctly, is that active travel should be 10% of the transport budget. And that would be a huge investment. But I think certainly one that the Chamber will look with great interest in future budget and negotiation. Uh, Tavish Scott, um, I think, made a very uh, relevant point about sport inspiring. Uh, and uh, we should make it happen. And I wasn't aware of the initiative he was projecting about the golf tour uh, around um, Scotland. I, I wish him well in that, and I look forward to reading uh, a lot about how that initiative develops um, in the future. Um, Sandra White, um, who's still here, um, talked about best, uh, best practice examples from her constituency. 
uh, about how that aids well-being. But I think she made a very important point about the Intel Generation Programme that we need to develop in any other Scottish Government uh, uh, developments. Uh, Joanne Lamont um, uh, made a very wide point, which was very correct, about how government uh, spends uh, its time in this place and should there be other debates we look at. We, of course, um, should focus on physical activity. But I think she made a very good point about the important role that Glasgow City carried out uh, in its uh, work, for example, attracting the Commonwealth Games, but uh, equally importantly, the very important legacy aspect of that. So we have the Commonwealth Games, but it's not just a one-off. It's about the infrastructure we build uh, for uh, the uh, long term. So in uh, summary, and I'll shock you, President Officer, being, by being under time for once in my entire life, um, this has been, um, as I said, an excellent uh, debate. Apologies for those that I haven't mentioned. Um, as I said in my introductory remarks, sport is the best tool for social prescribing and prevention. And in the spirit of consensus that has broken out today, Labour will support the Scottish Government motion, and I'm hoping will be reciprocated, he hasn't mentioned yet, um, and we will support the Tory amendment as well. Thank you. Thank you. Liz Smith, five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it gives me a uh, very great pleasure to sum up on behalf of the Conservatives on what's been a, a very short, uh, but nonetheless very important and very enjoyable uh, debate. Uh, sport has a very considerable role, as I think we've all agreed, about the country's future health, well-being and prosperity, and that's been very self-evident throughout all the speeches. Uh, though I think it was Tavish Scott who said that actually sport itself is not uh, particularly relevant in that context, but something tells me Mr Scott, that when you go to Anfield on Saturday, you will have a very different view on that perspective. Of course, sport transcends uh, politics, thank goodness for that. Uh, it gives uh, hope to millions of people and uh, it does not respect political divisions and nor should it. In fact, it can develop so many shared experiences, values and purposes, along with the bu building of personal pride, skills and responsibilities. Now, very many members who've spoken in this debate have pointed out that there is a great deal of educational evidence uh, showing that encouraging more physical activity has proven benefits of improving levels of attainment. And in the context of the attainment debate at the moment, uh, that could hardly be more important. Uh, my colleague Brian Whittle mentioned initiatives such as the STEP programme, a bespoke school-based literacy programme that is aimed at pupils in primary four and five, and has a very proven track record of encouraging children to develop the fundamental skills that are needed to learn successfully. Certainly, nobody pretends that that is an easy task. Brian Whittle made a very important point when he mentioned uh, the STEP programme. Um, it's not just about funds and facilities that are undoubtedly scarce, uh, but it is about some of the barriers that are in the way uh, when it comes to ensuring that there are enough people, professionals and volunteers to support all the sports activities that we need. But he also talked about the better understanding that is required. And I think we all need to take lessons uh, in what that understanding uh, has to be composed of. So just as we've had to deal with uh, a very difficult uh, and complex situation regarding the debates that we've had in this chamber over alcohol, over drugs, uh, smoking, I think we need to be very bold in our approach uh, to sport too. Because the future of our young people is far too important, as indeed is the social fabric of our nation and the economic rewards of developing a sporting infrastructure for exactly the reasons that Joanne Lamont uh, cited in her excellent speech. She may not see herself as a sports lady, but uh, I have to commend the fact that she made some extremely important points in what she said. Because the research uh, by Sport Scotland uh, on the economic impact of sport uh, on the, particularly on the, on the social aspect of that economic impact uh, contributes so much to our local communities, to the jobs that are available in our communities and of course to consumer expenditure and the income that comes back from that and that is hardly an insignificant sum. So I would suggest that the essential uh, starting place is to build upon the projects which we know have actually worked and the Minister has uh, cited uh, a couple of these. But I think it's not just about the quantitative uh, evidence that we have, it's about the qualitative evidence uh, that proves that progress is being made. And we all have in our constituencies examples of very good projects. But for me, the most successful projects have some defining characteristics. And uh, Brian Whittle mentioned some of them when he talked about the sort of um, cross um, different portfolios approach that we have to have. For me, it's not just about expanding the numbers that are involved in sport, that's important. It's much more about the quality of the experience 
that people have and the feeling that they are able to do that uh, without any of the impediments and barriers that sometimes face them. It is about access to professionally trained PE teachers, particularly in the youngest years that first sparks that interest. But it's also about ensuring that it's much easier for people to volunteer. And I note uh, what the Sports, uh, Scottish Sports Association has said in terms of in, uh, developing employer schemes which support and encourage that volunteering. And Alison Johnson and I have been privileged uh, to serve uh, as co-conveners on the cross-party uh, group on sport. And I think one of the main messages that we've had in recent times is about the quality of the volunteering programme and just how much uh, we need to encourage that because it is such a crucial part of ensuring that we um, build to the future. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I will uh, finish my remarks and I think it's impossible in the time we have to do justice to everybody. I can give you an it. extra minute, Ms Smith, if you would like it. Well, I shall take it because I think, <laughs> <laughs> un 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 unlike uh, um, what uh, the Labour Party was saying, um, I, I think I will uh, take it up because David, D D David, David, that's very generous of you, but thank you very much for that. Because I, I do think there's some really important things that have come out from the cross-party uh, group on sports because we've had uh, privilege to witness it firsthand, the outstanding work uh, that goes into so many of the third sector groups that promote the extracurricular activities in schools, um, but especially with children who might be denied the opportunity elsewhere. And a lot of these are about unsung heroes um, who work day in, day night in, in some cases, uh, trying to ensure that these youngsters are given an opportunity that we don't always know about. And I think we should reward that work and we're not always very good at uh, doing that. But let me finish about the situation where you are building confidence and self-esteem. Because if the mental well-being uh, of our society is to improve, that confidence and self-esteem is something that is so important, just as well as obviously uh, the health ambitions that we have. Now, that's not always a popular theme these days. Sometimes people see that as slightly elitist. I don't believe it is at all. I think it's something that is uh, an intrinsic part of every young person, in fact, every person, uh, as they start out on the journey of finding their inner being. And sport is absolutely crucial in that respect. So thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, for allowing me uh, the extra minute. I hope it's been worthwhile. Thank you. I call Claire Hockey to wind up the debate. Uh, seven minutes will take us up to decision time. Thank you very much, um, Presiding Officer, and I'm delighted to close the debate on changing lives and have been struck by the many contributions across the Chamber that highlight the way sport and physical activity can be used intentionally to bring about positive change for communities and people. In particular, I was encouraged by the ways in which organisations are working together uh, to use the collective power of sport and physical activity to create positive lasting change for individuals and communities to address specific need. And if I can turn to some of the really interesting contributions that there were across the Chamber, I think it was a very consensual debate today and, and showed our Parliament at its best when we can all come together. And Brian Whittle spoke very passionately, not for the first time in this Chamber, about the power of sport and its holistic impact on lives. Um, David Stewart is, also spoke about um, individuals with long-term conditions and the importance of them remaining physically active and the impact that that can have. Alison Johnson's contribution spoke of the building activity into daily lives and how important green spaces are to us all. Um, and uh, Tavish Scott, unsurprisingly, spoke very proudly about Shetland's sporting success um, and I think um, uh, he also spoke about Paul Laurie and the, the golf uh, tour that he was uh, talking about and the meeting with the Deputy First Minister. And I can assure him that a number of actions have been picked up by Sports Scotland, the Scottish Government and Education Scotland following that meeting. Sandra White spoke of the award-winning uh, CAPA project and, and extra funding was announced by uh, my colleague, uh, the Minister for Public Health and Sport last year for that project, uh, an extra £130,000 uh, um, last September. Um, George Adam unsurprisingly spoke to us about Paisley and St Mirren, um, but also about the Active Together project, encouraging people with MS to be active with others and join in the community. And uh, Joanne Lamont um, 
contribution about the infrastructure left in Glasgow struck a really personal note with me today um, because in my own constituency of Rutherglen um, we, um, we were um, blessed with Cunningar Loop which was a, a development from the Commonwealth Games, uh, the largest urban uh, park in uh, South Lanarkshire. And only yesterday it won the RTPI Awards for Planning Excellence for Health and Wellbeing and has had a real big impact in terms of uh, the health and wellbeing of my constituents and of many more across across Glasgow. Jenny Goldruth spoke about the success of Fife Sports and Leisure Trust and its increase in participation. And we heard about Gillian Martin's passion for cycling and the need for safer infrastructure and her ambition for Scotland to be a cycling nation. So really varied contributions. And it is, uh, presiding officer, it's clear from the, the work that organisations do in communities, and we've heard about much of that, the very positive and life-changing effects that sport and physical activity can have on mental wellbeing. And mental health is an absolute priority for the Scottish Government and strong research is now emerging to support the strong positive links of physical activity on positive mental well-being. Almost everyone knows of the benefits of being physically active and we want people to be more active more often, in part because being active is good for mental well-being. Being physically active can reduce stress, it can improve self-esteem and can help to manage depression and anxiety. And I want to see an increase, I, I, I'm really pressed for time, sorry Mr Stewart, I, I want to see an increase in the number of people who engage in sports and physical activity, not for its own sake, but for the wider benefits it can bring, particularly in terms of mental well-being. However, doing sport isn't just about playing in teams or joining a club. Any kind of physical activity can boost mental well-being from swimming, walking, dance or golf. For example, the, the Changing Room is a great example of partners working together through football to promote men's mental health and well-being through the power of football. And the ALBA project also builds on the well-established links between physical activity and improved mental health. I'm pleased that Sam H are an important partner in the delivery of the Changing Lives Through Sport and Physical Activity programme through their partnerships not only in Changing Life and ALBA projects but with Scottish Sports Futures to deliver a joint programme that will promote positive mental health for young people and address stigma and discrimination felt by those with mental health problems. And last week I met with staff delivering the Community Strides project a collaboration between Sam H and Jog Scotland, funded through the Changing Life Funds, and it provides opportunities for people from the BAME communities to get active with local jogging groups. I was struck by the passion of the staff to use jogging as a tool to impact on individuals' physical and mental health. And they're getting to know the women attending the sessions and working with them to understand and overcome potential individual and community barriers to participation. This work with BAME communities builds on an existing successful partnership which sees jog leaders undertake mental health awareness training and then wear a simple I'm here badge which they can use as a tool to start a conversation with their members and show that they are open to chatting with, about mental health. And the intention is not to turn jog leaders into trained counsellors but to make them feel more confident to provide a listening ear and know how to help members find more help if they need it. In August 2016, Sam H also announced the development of Scotland's Mental Health Charter for Physical Activity and Sport. And the charter was developed through the Sam H People Active for Change and Equality Project and funded by Comic Relief. Scotland's Mental Health Char Charter for physical activity and sport aims to empower physical activity and sports communities to improve equality and reduce discrimination, ensuring mental health and wellbeing is not a barrier to engaging and participating and achieving in physical activity and sport. The Charter encourages organisations to show their support by signing up to the Charter to create a positive change and it's encouraging to hear about the diversity of the range of signatories from Sports Scotland governing bodies such as Basketball Scotland, Leisure Trust, PE departments, local schools, local clubs that have already signed up to the Charter and I would encourage those involved in sport and physical activity across communities to sign up to the Charter too and this will signal to anyone with a mental health problem that there is support out there to help overcome the barriers to getting active and achieving their own personal goals. 
In closing this debate, I want to thank members for their contributions and that we will all continue our efforts to deliver wider outcomes for individuals and communities across Scotland through sport and uh, physical activity. And the Government will be supporting both the Conservative and Labour amendments. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on changing lives through sport and physical activity. And we're going to turn straight to decision time. The first question is that motion 16708 in the name of Kezia Dugdale on Hutchison's Hospital Transfer and Dissolution Scotland Bill be agreed. And this is to pass the bill, so we will hold a, a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 16708 in the name of Kezia Dugdale is yes, 100. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The motion is agreed and the Hutchison's Hospital Transfer and Dissolution Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> Our next question is that amendment 17034.2 in the name of Brian Whittle which seeks to amend motion 17034 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on changing lives through sport and physical activity be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 17034.1 in the name of David Stewart, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. And our final question is that motion 17034 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, as amended, on changing lives through sport and physical activity, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. And I close this meeting. <laughs>